after the two sessions that we've had this week and uh, just to do a quick recap um, i just wanted to tell you that we started the week by uh, you know just pointing out the importance of palliative care especially highlighted even more in this wake of the pandemic and the humanitarian crisis that it has unleashed also we saw how important it is to discuss the medical legal ethical aspects of treating patients with covid-19 and the palliative in the uh, with the palliative care hat on yesterday we focused on symptom control that patients with covid-19 experience we also at many points talked and discussed about how important it was to communicate well to communicate what is happened to the happening to the patient along with the family because they are in two different places to communicate the uh, goals of care from the, what the medical team has decided and it's extremely important to take the patient and the family along with our discussions for a shared decision making we realized the amount of anxiety distress as well as uh, fear that these patients experience along with their families and how important it is for doctors to communicate well and for this we have two excellent facilitators today the main facilitator is dr param who is from pgi chandigarh he's actually a neurologist with a special interest in communication he actually teaches communication in healthcare in the indian academy of neurology so welcome dr param karbanda and co facilitating him will be dr dinesh kumar who is from anand gujarat he is a professor in community community medicine and works at the pramukh swami medical college so i'm sure you all will have a very interesting intriguing uh, one hour one and a half an hour today with both these gentlemen uh, to who will teach you not just the pearls of communication but how to deal with difficult situations just by knowing how where and when to talk so over to you dr dinesh and uh, dr param thank you very much dr dinesh we are ready for you oh, apologies i was a bit late for joining no so problem. as dr rajam has already summarized what we learned over last two days um, the topic for today will be dealing with the communication am i audible by the way uh, yes sir you are audible yeah yeah okay so we will be dealing with communication okay. so this will be kind of a link station between what we did over last two days and what we will be doing in the next two days okay. uh, see in palliative care setting including in the current covid settings many times in spite of uh, because the situation that we are usually dealing are quite uh, high stress situations both for the families as well as for the healthcare providers more so in covid setting so there are always chances that their uh, goals from the patient and family side as well as the care goals from the healthcare worker side uh, even though intentions from the both sides are common that we do best for the patient but sometimes we fail to meet in the center so there might be always be chances where these their goals and our goals we are not able to clarify to each other and which can lead to lots of disputes many of which are fortunately they are uh, very much avoidable and this holds good dinesh sir we lost you dinesh sir param i suppose you could take over okay aha uh -huh, yeah we will we'll have dinesh back when he is able to join in uh, uh my name is uh, param karbanda as dr rajam uh, introduced uh, and uh, i'll be presenting the today's session let me just get my slides up there so as dr dinesh and dr rajam was saying the importance of communication uh, so this is summarized in today's talk the slides are mainly uh, prepared by dr biju raghavan along with the pali covid and pallium india team who we will acknowledge at the end of the talk and uh, i have added few 
mnemonics of my own to make it more interesting and uh, you know interactive uh, to this so communication as everyone feels is is not only important for medical uh, field or medical uh, uh, and patient doctor communication patient nursing communication it is important in all fields of life and good communication as we know can can avoid many disputes what we plan to cover in today's uh, topic is a lot of things which are already given in your ebook and we we hope you have read the pages 10 and 11 from your uh, e ebook uh, so we'll discuss some challenges in communication uh, and uh, how to manage those challenges, the benefits of good communication, some do's and don'ts, then communicating bad news or serious illness as we call it, uh, some reactions to grief and uh, also some angry situations, how do we manage if such situations arise. So, uh, as as uh, as uh, uh, discussed before, we would really appreciate if you could put in your responses into the chat box, and uh, uh, Dr. Dinesh and other people, other faculty on the group, uh, will take them up, and uh, we can all discuss them together. So, to start with, uh, I would. Uh, if you could give us your thoughts on what do you think are the benefits of good communication? I mean, we are all good healthcare professionals and we give good treatment, we have good intentions, but in addition to all of that, do you feel there is a specific reason or benefits which come out of having a good communication with the patients and their families? Building trust, mm, developing good. good rapport, developing good patient doctor, a healthy patient doctor. Good rapport, patient and Relation. doctor relationship. And in fact, it is all healthcare professional. Sometimes nursing professional are actually closer to the patient and they discuss more and they develop better rapport and friendship with the families than the doctors who come for rounds. So, so it's very important all the team uh, to have a good communication skill. So that is very good. Yeah. So the better complaints, the overall treatment outcomes are good. It makes overall situation more comfortable, both for family as well as the healthcare providers. There's overall mm -hmm. better understanding of the situation by everyone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's, that's excellent responses. And that is, that is, these are some of the way important benefits uh, of good communication. Till we have more responses, I'll go on to the next uh, uh, thing. So uh, do you all think these communication skills are, uh, they come naturally or uh, they can be learned also like any other science we learn? So are we born with all our communication skills or there is benefit of doing some formal, you know, talk or course on it. Do we have any responses? Or? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, carry it could on. could be both. Part of it is natural, but it can definitely be learned or improved upon. Mm -hmm. Then we still have some uh, responses to your, what are the benefits of communication. Mm -hmm. Carry on. Then we have time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, basically, it revolves around the same thing that there will be overall good trust between the both care providers as well as the patients' relatives. And overall, there will be a sense of security and reliability from both the sides. So basically what we are processing is both the sides will be on the same platform to come to any decisions regarding the goals. That is the grossly what is coming out. That's as great. far as uh, the yeah, yeah, vulnerability of the skill is concerned, the general theme that appears is People believe it is both. Uh, there is something which is inherited naturally, but also there is a sense that it can be improved upon or uh, it can be learned. So both these things, that's the common thing that we are seeing. Absolutely. So happy to have such good and, uh, you know, knowledgeable responses. I'm sure you read and probably have some background in good communication also. So yeah, absolutely right. Uh, uh, we do have uh, good natural communication skills but not as good as sometimes we believe. 
you know, when, before I got into communication healthcare, even I used to think that I know everything. What is there to learn in communication? And I talk well, I can give good talks in neurology. But once I went through the formal courses and I realized there's a lot of it which can be learned like any other procedure or any other science. So yes, as you said, it's, it's, it's actually a combination of both. The last one is that, uh, uh, why do you think that uh, communication is more required but more challenging in COVID? What are the difficulties you think uh, will come in uh, communicating with the patient and their families during COVID times? For those who joined late, you can answer any of the questions. Everything yeah, is still please open. do. It's, it's, it's a please feel free to chat anytime in between. We'll, we'll take them up as and when we can. Uh, so feel free, we'll keep it as a semi-formal or informal. Uh, since you already read the book, we'll, we, we are here to discuss. More discussion is better than just me talking about it. Yeah. So in COVID setting, the presence of uh, PPEs, they do form important barrier. Then there is lots of uncertainty in COVID. Also, the course can sometimes be very, very fast deteriorating. So the overall time available is probably on the lower side to establish the rapport. Wow. Health care workers are under considerable stress. I don't know if I have anything more to add to what we already got. So thank you very much for yeah, such wonderful responses. There's fear of death among everyone, like yeah. everyone involved. Oh yeah, healthcare professional stress is also there. And Both are anxious here, yeah. doctor and patient. You know, once in more of the illnesses in routine times, it's, it's the doctor who's in charge and the patient who's anxious. In this situation, both the healthcare workers, doctor, nurses, everyone is under stress, so they're anxious. So that is a very different, unique point in COVID times. And Thank Evangeline you. has mentioned a very important point. Yeah. We cannot hold hands anymore. We cannot pat on someone's back. We cannot hold the hands. Yeah. The human touch is also missing. Uh, we'll talk about that. Although, uh, if in properly covered PPEs, uh, we still recommend that wherever possible, uh, they can be, yes, of course, not without precaution, but touch is still important uh, in sick patients, especially who are isolated and are very, very lonely. Also, the family is usually outside the setting, so family is not available for communicating. So, absolutely. Thank you, everyone, for your responses. Just keep writing. We'll stop again. And also write if there's anything from the ebook uh, you want uh, me or any of the other faculty to lay more stress on, which you think is more important for you. We'll be happy to come back to it at the end of the talk. So moving ahead, I just, as I said, I uh, make few of my own, uh, you know, mnemonics to remember what are the good. So I have a four C's, actually five, uh, which I talk about uh, while talking about uh, good communication skills uh, with patients. So the first is, is for candid. Candid means honest. It's very important that honesty does not take a hit. You know, in enthusiasm, sometimes we want to give a very good prognosis. We, we have seen and we have all done it that nay, nay, thik ho jayega, person will be fine. You know, he'll walk out the hospital, run out of the hospital. We mean well. But the important stuff is that we can twist the style with which we say, it, but we should not twist the facts. Lest it is taken later that we have not communicated honestly. So candid is very important. Clear, that means it should be said very clearly, non-ambiguously, where we don't know, we accept we don't know, but the rest of it is in a language which is simple and the patient understands. Concise, if patients, as we've talked in a little while, if patients are under stress, too much information uh, may not be processed. So it has to be concise. And last is complete, that we need to be sure that everything has been said. Uh, and I'll just show you a video about it. The last one, which is informal C, is that if we care genuinely about the patient, a lot of communication will actually become more e will become easier and facilitated. So I'll just show you about the completeness of communication. This is a clip from the internet where, uh, you know, there is a motivational group and a newcomer is uh, shown how to learn to tr trust other people. So the newcomer, as the instructor is telling, uh, stands on the chair and uh, closes the eyes. And uh, the instructor is explaining everything. Everyone else will gather around. He tells him everything and then he has to fall. 
and he has to trust other people and they will catch him so he has done everything but as you see that uh, he forgot one thing he did not tell that which uh, side to fall so unfortunately he's bending forward where the people are back so the completeness is is, is important and uh, what we call is the importance of teach back so once we have a communication we ask the patient to teach back means tell us in their own words that is a very very important tool we can use where they they we come to know that have they really understood what we said other things which uh, come in uh, are that it has been seen that uh, people who have been communicated well with empathy their blood pressure sugar control uh, are also better these are all scientific research paper they have better pain scores they have they have fewer unnecessary tests and they understand the plan better they get involved in their treatment and their as you wrote already their uh, uh, compliance to treatment is better and overall the patient outcomes are also better so we, uh, you are all familiar with the ramesh now who's been admitted to the covid ward so he's clearly very anxious and unsettled and um, he keeps asking to see his family whether i'll see them again his son wants to know what will be the outcome will his father live uh, they've had so much to read about covid they have so many queries so this is where good communication comes to understand and discuss the issues the issues may not be same as what we are thinking the issues in his mind may be that his son is not doing very well in work ramesh is on the bed who's going to look after the family has he given covid to his grandchildren before coming there can be isolation anxiety and people can be very afraid of dying and the family may be worried and confused so all these things may be taken into account Uh, rather than be assuming that what is wrong with them so this is where the communi communication skill come so what are the challenges to uh, communication uh, both in general times and covid times as you said there is lack of uh, uh, rapo there is no time to build rapo and uh, there may be language issues there is pps and so many things which come so there are challenges which are faced by patients so there can be fear anxiety now we go to the hospitals every day but the patient is coming for the first time sometimes it skips our mind that the for the patient i know many people in my family who don't step into the hospital they will send somebody else when some of their loved one is and so a lot of people have this anxiety or phobia of in the hospital so their communication and their uh, receptiveness may be may be clouded by fear and anxiety they may be having anger frustration things are not going well and they keep hearing medical jargon cardiomyopathy lung damage cytokine storm which they don't know what it means and all this may lead to uh, uh, cognitive clouding so we have to be very very cautious about putting people at ease very interestingly uh, i was watching this movie last night uh, many of you may have watched uh, sushant singh's last uh, a movie called dil bechara which is uh, based on uh, the fault in our stars and uh, and uh, i came across this scene which uh, so well describes what i'm talking about here or we are discussing from the patient's point of view uh, i'll just play it lekin is halat mein us wajah se milne se main dar rahi thi i guess hum sab dare hue the माँ बाबा को डॉक्टर्स के मेडिकल शब्दों से डर लग रहा था जितना अच्छा डॉक्टर उतने ही कॉम्प्लिकेटेड वर्ड्स। बाबा सिर्फ सर हिला रहे हैं पर उन्हें कुछ समझ नहीं आ रहा so uh, so 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 well fitting into what we are talking so this is not a communication expert who's made the movie i haven't told you any 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 suspense of the movie don't worry if you haven't seen it it's just a middle of the movie scene so so this is from the probably the script writer has faced these issues sometime or the novel writer has faced these issues that people are talking medical words they 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 and my father has no capacity to understand so well described uh, exactly the points what we talking about so i brought this clip along uh, 
next is challenges faced by uh, family and society. So there is fear, as we know, there's a lot of stigma going around. Uh, every day we hear cases where healthcare workers are not allowed into the house or the family where there's a COVID positivity, people are shunning them. They're asking them to move out of their apartments. They're as if the COVID is going to go across the wall to other people, it can't. But we need to educate people regarding all this and uh, all this can be weighing very heavily on them. And then there are challenges, as you mentioned, um, uh, there is, this is uh, the top photo is how we look normally. The healthcare professionals, we are smiling, talking and uh, visible. And in today's times, we are like this, like an astronaut and with, with uh, maybe even not our eyes showing properly the rest of the body. So we all look like clones of each other. There is no personal warmth or rapport building with people. So these, these are a lot of issues which are coming across in COVID times. Then the distance, the family is not with the patient and, um, uh, and their own anxieties and stress uh, come in. So these are the challenges we need to take care of when we are dealing uh, with patients during COVID times. This picture is uh, from uh, some hospital where they, uh, and a lot of people have started doing that. They put pictures on their uh, PPEs so they come across as human beings uh, rather than you know just uh, uh, robots uh, and put your name across uh, the PP so people identify you it gives more humanizing look and maybe if you're posted in the ward for more than one day you could build a rapport with the patient they know your name and picture who's behind this uh, mask and who's behind the suit and, and very importantly uh, in COVID times, as you all know, that uh, healthcare workers may be the only family available to them, even if they unfortunately pass away. So this point is very, very different. You know, the whole family comes, they go into the ICU to see the patients in normal circumstances. They are not being allowed to meet them. So sometimes when the healthcare ambulance comes and takes away the COVID patient from the home, that may be the last time they see their loved ones. It's a highly stressful situation. So, so what we can do sometimes, people have done that is that if people pass away, if the healthcare workers along with them, you could call up their family or later meet up if whatever is appropriate and tell them that they were comfortable, they were like this, they said something, they gave a message for you and we were there with them in your place. That can help, uh, you know, decrease the grief a little. Uh, of the family. Anything uh, on the Dinesh uh, or anybody else wants to chip in before I go to the next set? We don't have anything any on the chat. Yeah. But uh, what we would also like participants, if they actually face some of the issues related to communication and they are providing care to the patients, they can bring up those issues. So the theoretical framework definitely we are discussing. But if you face some real issues, which can be brought up and which can be used to enhance the learning. I think that will be quite useful. Yeah, absolutely right. So yeah, so, please please keep telling your thoughts about uh, all these. Uh, Dr. Marion has uh, said uh, that uh, one of the concerns he has is whether or not the patient can hear uh, her talk and if they can feel her concern from behind the mask. I mean, even when you're conveying it, you're not quite certain if the patient is mm -hmm. you know, uh, receiving your concern in the same way. Wow. That's an excellent point, uh, Marianne. Uh, two, the, actually, you've made two points. One is, uh, I'm going to, which is already on the screen, I guess. Uh, the, so we'll talk, come to that later. And the previous one is that, can the patient here talk? So uh, it happens in many cases, but I can tell you about neurology. We say that we keep talking to the patient, even if the patient is apparently unconscious. Sometimes they may be just able not able to talk they have a tube in and their eyes are closed they are sedated but they may be listening so if you keep talking to the patients actually you feel that sometimes they get up when they improve they really appreciate that like in stroke patients they have a face yes but they can hear so there is no harm talking to the patient when you're around the patient even if the patient is apparently uh, unconscious your second point, which is on the screen, is uh, regarding yes. So even if we talk with a joyous voice, uh, it's surprising how much our voice and our eyes can convey our emotions. So if we are uh, if we are smiling, our eyes can convey it a lot, as you can see in the picture. And even if our voice is benign and compassionate, this can come across even 
through the uh, pp which we are wearing from same thing has been uh, brought up by evangeline mm -hmm. so it is mentioned like people can see beyond beyond the mask calls by the way you talk by tone of your voice so definitely we'll try to ensure that if uh, whatever yeah. barriers we can take care of we take we become slightly louder and all those things however i also feel like our being present there itself will communicate a lot so yeah. in addition to the words are there everything is there but the very fact that you are making a effort you are there for some time that also i think will communicate a lot to the patient the concern that you have for them so i think that is also I, important thing to keep in mind i know tinesh uh, this is very becoming very important because we are i mean we would like to say that we are all doing very well and very the best but uh, we accept that we also have anxieties but if we are properly protected uh, our anxieties should not become irrational and uh, people should not complain that nobody is going near them if we are protected by a ppe uh, we should try to be around the patient and as we said about the touch and we are going to talk about so we should we need to keep our fears in check also that if we are protected we need to go near the patient and not just you know wave uh, to them from a distance so yeah absolutely right so the other few things are that uh, you know the way we talk uh, when the patient is conscious it is important that people calling people by their diagnosis sometimes dehumanizes them that uh, this is uh, take this covid to that what take this covid patient to there try to call them by name try not to mix the humanity human being from the name of the disease so so that is very important and and take people for what they are and not try to segregate this based upon their social standing or uh, you know the vip status so these are all these are all these these actually help people to decrease their anxiety and and make the make them more receptive to the treatment the next one is that uh, uh, sometimes in good faith we say some things which can have a negative effect so we we need to be a little cautious about that uh, something like don't get so worried over such a small problem you know we know that uh, the mortality rate is not very high in covid but it is there more than many other diseases or other flus and for the patient who's coming in they have taken so much to hear about covid that they almost feel that i'm going into ward or icu means i'm not going to come out so we should try not to say things which can you know weaken their resolve uh, something like that so many people are facing bigger problems on the other hand what we could do is we could what we say is normalize their emotion acknowledge that in your situation it is okay to feel anxious it's okay to be worried uh, we will do what we can but considering what you're going through it's 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 all right for you to be scared this actually helps the patient and builds a better communication with the healthcare worker or provider and then again as i mentioned briefly in the beginning that we should not assume what is causing their worry you know and just say they don't worry covid 19 uh, has much higher survival rate where uh, where the issues for poor people may be very different we should ask what is it that is worrying you rather than telling them oh you are worried i'll do this for you they may be worried about their children not eating at home tonight or have i infected anyone so listening is a skill which is very important for good communication dr param there is a question yeah like how do you reassure when they are very rapid changes in the clinical state so probably yeah. what he or she would like to, dr darshan would like to ask is or like how do we go about giving the right kind of reassurance yeah yeah so okay uh, you would like to, you want to say something yeah, yeah i can uh, yeah. If, yeah. okay so yeah so the first rule is we do not commit to too much stuff especially in covid times as you have very rightly pointed out that uh, that uh, we try to over commit to patients so this is kind this patient is stable ye bilkul ठीक हो जाएगा दिस इज शी और ही और शी इज गोइंग टू डू वेल सो ओवर कमिटमेंट वी एज हेल्थ केयर प्रोफेशनल स्पेशली डॉक्टर्स वी वॉन्ट टू फील इट्स इन बिल थिंग दैट वी नो एवरीथिंग एंड वी हैव टू गिव अ वेरी कंक्रीट आंसर एक्चुअली वी डोंट वी कैन से वी कैन एक्सप्लेन ऑब्जेक्टिवली दैट दिस इज हाउ इट वर्क योर पेशेंट इज वेरी स्टेबल 
there is a very high chance that he will remain stable. But in COVID, as we all know, things can progress. Even apparently healthy people without comorbidities can get an inflammatory reaction and they can go down. We will communicate with you anything which improves or uh, becomes worse. So this is a very good help. Rather than telling them what is going to happen, we tell them that we will keep communicating with you regularly as this slide is appropriately in front of us that do regular breathing, uh, briefing as many world leaders are doing these days uh, is, is very important. So tell them that we will tell you rather than tell them what will happen. So these are two very different things and this will help uh, the patients. I hope I've answered some of your uh, query. The reassurance should be very realistic. Yeah. So it should not break the hope to zero and also you don't give any false hopes. So you have to I, maintain that delicate balance. So you don't break the hope to zero and don't give very false assurance also. Yeah. Dr. Darshan, so what I think is, you answered your is, question. Yeah. Thanks, Dinesh, for adding on to that. Yeah, we tell them the right statistics, but we, we highlight the positive as far as we can without changing the, uh, the, the actual thing, facts. That is very important. And the human touch. So it is important uh, that uh, if we are wearing a PPE and it is safe to touch the patient, Touching the patient is, is always gives a warm and a personalized feeling and uh, makes them feel better. Although sometimes in cultural context has to be kept in mind, you know, that male, female touch, uh, some cultures may not be very comfortable. So if you're working the area, you would know how it works uh, in your area or the local culture. All right. Uh, we... Uh, move on uh, to the next uh, set that is as we said managing an angry situation so now uh, Ramesh we yesterday you talked we discussed regarding that with all the comorbidities putting ventilator may be more counterproductive than uh, this to his son and family and and they have understood that uh, but when the, once the lockdown opens his second son comes from another state where he lives and he's heard there that you know some hospitals are not offering ventilators to older people as if their lives are not important due to shortage and he 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 feels that that is the reason he 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 does not accept the discussion we had with the rest of the family and his brother uh, before he came and 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 he becomes very upset doubting our motives of uh, not uh, putting Ramesh on a ventilator and he wants to have a chat with us so this is another situation now. The situation we had uh, with the rest of the family, we had to explain this to them and we have to explain this to this person, but there is a very important difference. They were in a calm state of mind. This person has coming in with some pre-made thoughts of somebody who's told them and he's angry and upset about it. So dealing with this person will require extra careful communication skills. So this is we call this dealing with anger because we know that anger is such a negative emotion. It causes stress and if not managed in time, it can turn into rage. Rage is a situation when you know our thinking brain is bypassed. And we are like yeah, animalistic instinct as you say are posing and, and we, 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 we lose our rationalism. And that can lead to a lot of violence or sometimes angry uh, situations which, which can be avoided. All of them cannot be avoided, so we need to know how to deal with them. So if, if there is, now this person is already, you know, a little angry. And just telling them that, you know, we have told your brother, uh, it's okay, he has specific issues in his mind which need to be addressed. But before that, we need to calm him down. So how do we do that? So there are a few things uh, what we follow. One is facilitating the anger to flow away. So we, we do not minimize what uh, his problem is. Although we know what we're doing, but we need to explain it to him. We stand and listen, preferably in a respectful manner with a slight chi force is like bent forward, confident eye contact and let them talk. In fact, encourage them to talk uh, 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 more. Because once they talk, the, the, uh, the, the, the anger will come down. However, 
in case there is a person is very angry and you feel there is a risk of violence it is better to maintain a distance what we do is make, maybe have a big table between the two although we are standing but somebody suddenly gets angry they don't lunge and uh, you know hit us so it's important to have that and if there's a really really bad situation we have help or security stand by once the situation resolves then we need to sit down and correct the correctables uh, one important thing is what we can offer is what we do is that uh, we tell them that even after this if you're still unhappy you don't have to agree to me there is this room this is a register you can make a complaint it's a very human thing you would have seen if i tell you that you can go and complain against me i have nothing against him it makes a lot of difference rather than being defensive we tell them it's your right if you would like to write something to my administrator we will deal with it or my team anybody in my team that really i have seen it helps decrease the anger of the patient because deep down everyone is a nice person it's a lot of fear and anxiety which is making them behave this way so the six c's again and mnemonic for conflict resolution is four is we already talked about complete clear concise candid the other two are calm as that we need to even if the patient is talking in a derogatory language we need to play the calm person here and let them talk and we need to swallow our ego a bit and the last thing is commonality the commonality means that uh, sorry the commonality here is uh, we know it is right it is correct that uh, uh, that uh, uh, ventilators are in short supply which is is right so once you say you are right again the anger comes down we are right that your ventilators are in short supply but this is also true and very honestly we tell you that is not the reason we are decided not to give ventilator to your father because they were totally personal reason to him not that we don't have ventilators so once we have a commonality and we call in his brother or something things can improve fast the next is self care obviously we can also sometimes get angry so important thing to do is have good self care look after us well good sleep good eating have some colleague like a buddy system in the army they say uh, to look after each other in danger situations that are you am i losing it sometime am i acting anxious or unduly worried or angry your friend could honestly tell you and that person should be somebody you trust so that is what something like a buddy system we call and uh, as i said a bit of a meditation and whatever works for us like you'll be dealing we'll be dealing with that in spiritual in i think tomorrow day after on friday and those things can be used for our own self also anything else i i'd stop for a minute here yeah uh, there is a query yeah uh, like how do we tailor the communication when we are dealing with children especially okay yeah so i my my upfront uh, thing is that uh, i i am um, mostly a adult doctor so my actual communication as a clinician is more with adults but theoretically there are some points uh, which i would tell you and i would uh, encourage if anyone in the faculty is more yeah. dealing with kids uh, because there is a lot of issues from from one extreme that we need to take their family into confidence if it's minus to the other extreme is not denying them a knowledge at all because kids can have various depths of understanding at different ages and different cultures any anyone dinesh you want to talk anyone about kids no, specific rajam is there rajini is there yeah, yeah. does any of the faculty members would like to contribute here on Stella, especially madam. communicating with the kids uh, part uh, because <laughs> Yeah, so with the, with children, what we often find is that we have to be aware of what developmental milestone they're at. Um, I mean, that's that's taking uh, uh, th that's after considering if uh, if they are neurologically impaired in any way or whatever. But otherwise, uh, we we need to look into the fact that uh, which developmental stage they're at because the way they process information differs at every stage. So an eight-year-old child will. Uh, absorb information differently from a 12 year old child uh, there's something called formal operational thought that comes into play only in the early adolescence and uh, abstract uh, ideas are not really you know understood by children metaphors are not uh, understood by children you cannot 
uh, really sort of uh, give a child an abstract sort of explanation and expect them to to understand what you mean. And very often, very young children will take things very literally. So, for example, if you're explaining to a child that that you know an older person is has passed away, for instance, um, telling them that you know grandmother went to sleep and never woke up is not a metaphor the child will understand. The child will will probably be afraid to go to sleep, you know, because they 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 process information quite literally uh, when they are much younger, when they're four or five years old. So understanding that it takes a little bit of, um, I suppose. Uh, there's a lot of literature out there that tells you about these things. So if you are coming across children on a regular basis, then it would be a good idea to explore some of that literature. Uh, consent is a very big part of uh, communicating with children. Consent from, from the parents. And I've heard Param talk about that in other sessions. So Param, I want to just uh, touch upon the aspect of consent yeah. and the role it plays in communicating with children. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Riti. Param, you also have Rajini. Is... Yeah. Yeah. Sure, sure. I think I think the only point that I was really keen on bringing up was the part that Smriti mentioned about uh, the use of metaphors when speaking with children and the importance of using um, terms that are clear, even though it's 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 almost like we are more uncomfortable with using the word death and dying and dead. Um, but for children, it's very important that we can we do that in a gentle manner, but don't couch the terms. Uh, in in any uh, uh, you know like like Smriti said, people children can get afraid of falling asleep, thinking they may never wake up. So it's important that we're very clear about what we are trying to explain to them, and that was the only issue that I would want to bring up as well. Thanks. Thanks, Rajin. Thanks. There is suggestion from Marian that mm -hmm. we can try some other modes also, maybe art, stories, play, those kind of things. Yeah. So which uh, Smriti has already mentioned. So. Of course, when you are trying these modes, you have to be very vigilant to what is their neurological or intellectual developmental stage. So, I think that's a really important piece about using art and play, especially. So, um, uh, I think you know, for example, simple things like keeping a small mm -hmm. set of toys and animals and figurines in the dis in a in a family discussion room helps children to be able to cope. They sometimes are distracted and playing while we are speaking to them about it, but they they will you will see their actions with the toys saying that they're understanding what we're trying to share with them. So that's a very important piece. Yeah. So yeah. to summarize this discussion, I think uh, important yeah. thing is we keep in mind that uh, when we are dealing with children, either as the patients or maybe as part of the family also, we do think about how to involve them in the communication. And try to explore whatever little ways we can, based on our understanding of what is the intellectual level of the child's understanding. But definitely, they should be in the scheme of things when we are communicating with them, either as patient or maybe as a family members also. True, true, true. Yeah. Thank you, Dinesh, Rajni, and um, Smriti. Uh, so there are a lot of issues actually. If, if as Smriti said, if you're regularly communicating with children, because there are two things. One is telling children about talking about death, talking about serious illness of death of a family member or a parent, and there is entirely different set where you talk to the children regarding their own serious illness or possible demise. So these. There's a lot of recommendation. It's, it's, it's not something which I would want to go into detail right now. But uh, I think if you write to us, we can send you the articles and literature. There, there are a lot of recommendation about all of these things separately. So as, as you know, it's basic principles remain the same, but we need to take care of the child's uh, culture, their, their development state, their age, and, and uh, their uh, maturity to understand these serious issues. All right. The, uh, should I go ahead? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. We can come back to if there are more suggestions. Uh, so the la the last set in this today's uh, uh, session is about communicating serious illness. Uh, so let's say that Ramesh's pneumonia worsens. We had expected that in his situation. Yeah, he develops evidence of a cytokine storm and secondary infection and uh, and our worst fears like organ failure sets in and we feel Ramesh is terminal. So as we have promised to them that 
we can't promise that we'll save him, but we have promised that we will keep you informed. So this is time to call them and tell them that about the status and potential demise. If they want to see him on the camera or on WhatsApp or wherever. So this is the time to do it uh, if there is anything to be done. So this is this is dealt under serious illness communication. Uh, this is a spikes protocol developed by the cancer department at MD Anderson Hospital in 2000, which is very commonly used among our communication uh, programs. Uh, spikes basically is a six uh, step strategy, which uh, deals with the acronym of SPIKES. Uh, so I just go through briefly with them. So setting up an interview is very important. And first is being confident. You know, as healthcare professional, especially doctors, sometimes it's very difficult if we haven't been trained to talk about sad news or bad news, because we have been conditioned from the beginning of our training that we have become healthcare professional to save lives. So the moment death comes into the picture, many of us feel it's a failure on our part. So this is a big change we need to bring into our own system that death is part of treatment and death is the end of life and we do need to talk about it there can be a good death also it doesn't have to be a good life saving and bad death always so so once we are comfortable then we are more apt to talk about the serious stuff so one is the setting setting is that what we say is in any kind of a consultation, it should be uninterrupted. We usually have a side room next to the ICU or sometimes a ward where we call the family. We call it a family meeting. Uh, we do not have interruption. We don't have like people walking in. Once everybody's in, we uh, close the door and uh, we switch off our mobile so that they don't ring in between. We sit in a position where we are in front of the patient or maybe side of them that if you need to touch and console them after giving the news so it could be the family member or the patient i mean i just use a generic uh, word patients yeah uh, second is p the p comes from patient perception uh, and that is very important we ask that what do you know some of them may already know and they would be almost prepared and ready that they are going to hear the bad news and and but sometimes uh, People may actually not know. They, yesterday he was fine according to them and today you tell them die. So we need to know how, what is their status, what is their knowledge. And a very unique thing is that sometimes it's a combination of both. People want to know, and but they want to know good news. So they are conflicted in their mind. So it's a good idea to know. The third part is I, which is called it invitation. Invitation is just don't, we just don't throw the information like a stone. We ask them, uh, can we tell them the information, how much they would want to know? Is there anyone else who would want to know information? If the patient has nominated someone, that this is my person to talk to, we must make sure that we are talking to the right person. And after we get their invitation to talk, or we already have the patient's invitation to tell the family, then we give them the knowledge. As we said in the clear, non-technical terms, in a slow manner, which we call chunk and check, we throw and then sit back, not just keep going like a monologue. We, we give a small information, let it absorb if they have any question answer, then next go to the next step. And uh, the fifth is empathy, of course, we've talked a lot about in palliative care that uh, we are bound to have emotional reactions, uh, sometimes very, 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 uh, you know, florid, uh, emotional reactions right in up front people can have a meltdown we need to be ready to take care of that support them in a right way and the last is as for strategy strategy is that where do we go from here we make a plan sometimes there is not much to offer but we can still offer that we will make it as comfortable as possible or we would want to do so and so or this is the hospital policy to do so and so in this situation and if there is other plans to be made, very important to tell them that we don't have to discuss right now. If you are overwhelmed, I could sit here, you could go out, you want us to go out, we go out for 10 minutes, half an hour, whichever, it depends how emergency, how much emergency is this, we could come back and talk to you again. So all this, if done properly, uh, can really decrease the burden on the uh, patient or their families. Uh, Anything? Uh, so, so, but then I'll go to the. Yeah, yeah. Go. yeah. We'll stop here. Oh.
two minutes. Yeah. Yeah. So one is uh, how do you communicate over telephone? Like where you cannot use, use your non-verbal communication is missing. Body language you cannot use. So how do you go about using com these communication skills, especially when you are communicating over phone? So this is something very commonly used um, in these COVID times. We have to use them. Sometimes we are inside the ward and we can't meet the family outside. Sometimes they are not there in the hospital. We need to talk to them on phone. And sometimes uh, we need to do video calls. So, so it does take away a bit of a comfort from the communication, but we need to use the best case scenario. So the best case scenario is a video communication, if possible, on a WhatsApp or any kind of platform if the patient are technically missing. But sometimes we need to do it uh, just by a telephone call. And it does make a difference, but we will use all we have talked about today, having a gentle voice, being compassionate, being honest, being uh, giving the news properly. So all that we have discussed, we will need to do on phone and even more carefully because we are not seeing what the person's reactions are. So it can get a bit challenging, but that is the, the principle remains the same over technology. So there was uh, one more query. Yeah, 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 yeah. Please, please go ahead. Do we modify the spikes protocol in COVID situation? Oh, Are yes. I... Sorry, you carry on. I'm so sorry. Yeah, yeah, you were saying something. So the spikes protocol just gives a broad framework of how to go about. Of course, contents will vary. Then see who all will be there to share the news with you. So all those things have, you might have to adjust. But otherwise, grossly, setting up and uh, assessing patient's perception, empathy, strategy, everything will be same. Only thing is the invitation and part you might have to kind of uh, put some limitation, who all will be involved, who all can be involved. And knowledge, of course, the uncertainty level is quite high compared to other communications that we do because of the rapidly changing uh, knowledge scenario. So that knowledge part is also a bit challenging to handle. Otherwise, so I think the entire framework could be used. Totally agree, Dinesh. Yeah, yeah, I agree with you. These are broad guidelines. These are kind of, a, uh, you know, how to drive a car. But when you're driving on the road, where you brake and where you stop and start has to be improvised according to the situation. Of course, you can improvise uh, as and when the situation arises, as, as Dinesh has already talked about. So a brief mention about uh, what we call as the grief curve or the Kubler-Ross model uh, by Dr. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross is a very famous model of grief, uh, which is you know very commonly present today in times of uh, pandemic. Uh, so it 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 has uh, uh, about five stages, uh, which which uh, are the prototypical. I mean, uh, which are the sorry, the quintessential stages, but they don't have to follow in every patient. Patient may have straight away go to anger as we saw in our patient. They may not go into denial or bargaining or they can keep varying from one to the other back and forth. But broadly, these stages go as denial, which means that there was denial we saw. Oh, this is just a flu. This will, nothing will happen. I am very fit. Nothing will happen to me. And then when you realize, no, actually healthy people are also um, you know, getting affected by this, then there is anger. Who caused this? Why was it not controlled? So and so people didn't do their job well. So then anger comes in. Once the anger comes down, bargaining can come in. That once we are calm, then we bargain. Maybe I'm getting, we are, the world is getting uh, punished for the sins we have done, depending upon your spiritual religious background and your line of thought. Or if I, uh, if, if, if my family remains safe during time, I'll go so and so place and do so and so thing. And, and then once we things get worse, then depression could set in. This is very important to be recognized and tackled that we know that people are thousands of people are going to die, probably lakhs of people are going to die and many will have long standing consequences. And that is that is causes a lot of depression before the stage of acceptance comes. And then you start to get up and start doing things about it. So this is a which is modified by Dr. Chitin in the COVID perspective, as I read out to you. And, but of course, these things can vary. It's, it's again, as I said, broad knowledge uh, we need to have that we may recognize uh, when we see these stages coming in. 
in patients, in their, in their families, in ourselves and our teams. Uh, this effectively is the end of the presentation. I'll just go through, this is a page 11 on your ebook, um, just the algorithm. We have talked about most of the things already. Just a few things which I've highlighted in the next 30 seconds that, uh, that it's good to introduce ourselves. Sometimes we walk in and uh, uh, we just say, uh, tell them that your patient, are you with so-and-so patient? This patient is uh, having this problem. If you don't introduce, they don't know. Many times they don't know that are you the doctor, the nurse, the administrator, who is it? So it's good to introduce ourselves before we go talking to the patient or their families. And... Uh, ask them how, what is their state of mind right now, what is their emotional temperature as we call it, before we start giving them the knowledge which we have. This we've dealt with, that is knowledge, invitation, patient's perspective. And, and we ask them, if you have any specific questions, you know, we have a pre-made plan, we talked so much about and they had a totally different question. Uh, so we ask them, is this something specific you want to know about? And that, 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 that can help. And uh, we talked about normalizing the emotion already uh, in a part that we let them feel that it's all right and ask them. And if things are not under control, we don't have to say we have not caused the damage, but we can still say that we are extremely sorry that this is happening. We won't say that, uh, we, you know, that we've done our best. But we, we have done what we could and we are sorry that things have turned out this way. How we wish that things could be better. Um, so this is a better way of putting it. Uh, before we go on to discussion, I'll just, this, this is again, I think you already have this material sent to you and link sent to you, but you could take a picture or a screenshot and, uh, and, and this is further reading if uh, anyone wants to go and read more stuff. And if you want anything more, write back to us with your request and uh, feedback. These are the people who have contributed uh, to this program in slide making. And we are thankful to each and everyone who is here. Many of them are here, but some of them are not here today. And uh, please do, before leaving, in about 15 minutes, 20 minutes from now, give your feedback uh, so that we can help us understand are we communicating these things to you in a good way or not. There are definitely dark clouds in the sky, but our compassion and good communication can surely act like a silver lining. Thank you. Dinesh? Yeah, thanks, Dr. Param, for that crisp presentation. So, if you have some important queries, we can take up right now. Uh, meanwhile, as it is, let me bring out to everyone's notice that. Uh, when you are dealing with children, the consent of the parent has to be kept in mind, depending upon what legal uh, circumstances you are dealing with. But uh, consent is a very important issue, which is to be kept in mind before you kind of initiate any communication with the children, especially. Absolutely. Absolutely. In minors, um, we can go ahead and use our skills, but uh, consent of the next of kin parent or whoever is there, it, it is very important. We can take one or two queries at least. Sure, no, we, we have finished. We have more than 10 minutes. So let people, yeah, if they have anything because or any faculty wants to add anything, uh, we have yeah. time. Um, I'm seeing lots of thank you messages and wonderful session mm -hmm. messages. I'd like to I'd like to address no, one very important ahead. point as a reminder. Dr. Param brought it out in a very nice way with that clip from the movie. Um, about the father being befuddled by this barrage of medical information. I'd read somewhere uh, that in one study, 40% uh, of whatever the doctor tells you, the patient and the patient's family member forgets by the time they step out of the room. So, you know, when we receive news that we've got a diagnosis like COVID or something, it's such a traumatic experience for a lot of people. And I am now seeing even doctors, right, our colleagues, when they have had an unguarded exposure or if they turn positive, the anxiety in their mind is so high that after that, whatever I say, after, after you say the word positive, um, half of it is forgotten. 
so your brain is like in a fog of uncertainty at that time so i think it's good if we remember that we will have to constantly repeat what we said yesterday then every day when we are counseling patients in communication do a quick recap and then the next day's updates because that father's face really brought to me that feeling of yeah. how it is that's why it it was very spontaneous last night i was watching and i said oh this is that's like from our communication mean, session right out yeah. of there and yeah. and you know what as you said rashmi very very uh, uh, rightly that we have our own anxiety situations we have our vivas during uh professional training we have yeah. job interviews and every one of us has uh, experienced that once you walk into that room you think you forgot on everything this yeah. is exactly what happens to the people they yeah. they expect the worst want the best news they are totally yeah. confused and 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 that is why sometimes what we do this you, your point brought to my mind is uh, is, is a lot of people do is at the end of it what we talk we give a handout or That's about the disease yeah. or the medicine what we talked about so that the, we know that patient will be forgetting a lot of it yeah. because it's too much information so we ask them to go read about it come back another time another it may or may not work in the covid time this is more of a general thing and come back and you can discuss more any question which you are you can't think of right now and in covid time we could say this is my number you could go yeah. home and if you have anything you give us a call at this number yeah it's that really brought home very strongly the kind of uh, you know this confusion and fog that one is in when when you get news like this um so yeah thank you for bringing that up dr param very important also very important probably will be like uh, prioritizing because in covid the kind of patient loads that we are going to deal with or which we are already dealing with so time constraint is going to happen it's already happening so develop your own mechanisms to find out like what level of communication different patients and their families will be requiring identify the most uh, critical ones are the most critical communications and uh, try to some kind of prior- do prioritization for that also that will be really called for because otherwise it will not be possible to uh, communicate with the number of patients that we are dealing with. Dr Dinesh brings up a very important point of this of the burden on on the healthcare providers with the increasing uh, barriers in communication and the patient load um so what what dr param mentioned like giving a handout or there are, each yeah. of us will develop our own techniques so that we can tell them you have the handout from yesterday so it saves you time of repeating uh what you said the previous day but it also means that you are able to do a quick recap so if we have that level of compassion towards the patient's family that this is the worst time in their lives and it's hard for them to understand we may not get so irritated and you know how many times do i have to repeat the same thing again that's the feeling that comes in your mind that i told yesterday that the result was this or i have to repeat it again so understanding why, how to control our own frustration if we understand what's going on in their minds is easy and i think yeah. also that it's important that the team uh, communication within the team cannot be understated Absolutely. because very often i may not be uh, emotionally in a place to communicate if i've had a long tiring day of yeah. you know uh, at work uh, i may not have the right words at that moment or my emotions might color my ability to communicate but if i have a colleague who is also attending to the same patient i might i should be able to turn around to my colleague and say you know what today not today not me can can yeah. can help me out uh, but also um it's a great point with it's like dr yeah. parav mentioned the spotter so on depend it's it's the collective energy of the team yeah yeah and a debriefing is important i think uh, yeah. with with the team uh, i mean i'm sure everybody can't afford to do it every day but uh, at least regular debriefings especially when there's been a patient when there's been a difficult sort of trajectory with a particular patient or a p- patient mm. has started deteriorated when you didn't expect it to it's important to take the emotional temperature of the attending team uh, because that's also an act of self care somebody yesterday i think uh, asked about self care uh, that in itself is an inbuilt act of self care uh, and it shouldn't have to be the onus of one person on the team to constantly be the one to deliver bad news and it has to be split up uh, in one of the previous sessions someone had suggested that senior people with more experience should be the ones initially to give the bad news with the with the juniors you know there to observe but the better news is it's it's good for the for the 
for the juniors on the team to be able to give that to, to boost their own confidence. So those kind of discussions are quite important, I think, within the team, uh, both as a communication exercise as well as self-care exercise. Yeah, that's, that's absolutely right, Smriti. Yeah, that, that's what we try to follow. So the junior most delivers the good news and the senior people deliver the serious news along with the juniors in tow so that they have get time to get used to how it is to be done in, in a proper manner. And uh, at the cost of repeating, I think the teach back what I was talking about is very important. Uh, after we've told if we should have some time and generosity, we ask the patient or the family to repeat what is the important information they've gathered. And many times, you know, in my neurology epilepsy practice, what I what we do is that so-and-so anti-epileptic drugs for three months and come back after that, right? So what we mean is that you continue uh, taking and then what patients do sometimes is that they take it for three months and then they can't come for some reason, they stop it at three months and come back after four months, which is, which is something, these are the things you never thought they will do. But the onus lies on us that they need to tell us that we need to continue if we are not able to come back at three months. So it's very important for asking the patient to repeat what we've said. Points. Time constraints is a, yeah, Dr. Deepak for a case that uh, it's always a challenge in busy hospitals that you have 100 in the ward between two doctors and time concerned. So good communication is the key. That is very important that some doctors may see it at times uh, when under pressure, especially. I did not show this slide, uh, which is very relevant to your point, Dr. Varughese. Uh, there is research and I could share it maybe sometime, uh, which I have on a slide that time is the issue. Whenever we take communication classes, this is the first thing which people come up and say is we are so busy. We don't have luxury for this kind of good communication. It's partly true that it does take time, but it's very important that once you learn it and you do it repeatedly, it becomes your second nature. And, and it has shown that if you communicate well, to your patients uh, in the first go properly, it actually saves time because they will not come back repeatedly with uh, you know confusing queries. They won't come back again and again, ask you, what did you say? Ye khana hai, wo khana hai. Can they eat this? Can they not eat this? So if the communication has been done, they've shown that it can actually cut the moment of time of consultation by a couple of minutes. So it is not always true that communication, good communication will take extra time. Great point, Dr. Param. You know, it's like any procedure. We learn to do a lumbar puncture or a central line. The first time we do it as interns, we might take a very long time. But by the time we finish our residency, we are doing it, or you know, at a final level without any worries. And communication is like that, especially when we look at the kind of communication we typically shy away from. The more we practice it, the clearer we become with our words and phrases. It becomes like each, each of us will develop the lines that we will use for certain situations and we become practiced at delivering those lines with empathy. Uh, and it's far more effective that way. Yeah, true. That's and true. quicker too, yeah. I mean, plus your outcomes are better. I mean, the, if, you, if you do your communications training, your conversion for patients and family members, understanding completely and actually feeling empowered will be much higher. There is a very, very important uh, point by Dr. Nikhil D'Souza. And, and that is that uh, many times it happens uh, that, uh, uh, you know, uh, they, they will ask us, what do you think, rather than deciding when we are asking the patients to decide. And it is very true. Again, I mean, it's not possible to fit in everything into this session, but uh, there is, I, I, I have some work on that too. That uh, many times it happens, especially in our culture here, where the uh, taking decisions is not a very big thing when you're growing up and uh, your parents tell you what to do. People are not geared to take important decisions. They would want somebody else to take a call for them. And that becomes difficult. You know, we, we, we keep saying that we take patients' views on that and invitation and all that. Ultimately, they come and say that, uh, Doc, doctor, you tell me what to do. I can't make up my mind. So your point is very valid. What we do in that situation is that if you've done our communication well, this situation should become less and less, but there will be such situations. What I, I don't know what is the best thing to do. What I do is 
and instead of telling them what to do, I sometimes say that, you know, if I was in your situation, exactly, maybe I would have gone this way. Uh, and if it, if you agree with that, this is the way we could take. So that is the last resort. Sometimes we need to hold their hand and take them along rather than keep pushing them to take the call if they are not up to taking the call. Um, if I may also address another point that uh, Dr. Nikhil brought up about uh, talking, you know, explaining to family members in the best way possible and at the end of the day they turn around and say there's no problem, right? Um, mm -hmm. So here I would say, I mean, this is outside of the COVID uh, setting also, uh, talking to more than one family member is very important because different people in the family have different uh, sort of ideas, I mean, different understandings. Uh, this is something we talked about earlier also that um, where understanding the dynamics in the family, is, it's, it's, um, it, it's not always easy to do. But very often, especially in the Indian context, the person making the decision may not be the primary caregiver, it be the person who controls the finances, uh, who may not even be in the same city. So, you know, so getting a handle on that is, is a little bit important. And that's where somebody also has mentioned uh, a multidisciplinary team approach, which is so central to the palliative care approach that you have the social worker look into that side of things if you know if the doctors are too busy to see uh, you know if the person who's actually coming and talking to you is the decision maker maybe they're hoping that you're saying something else which might lead to them saying something like okay so there's no problem right because they have to go and then carry that communication back to the person who's making the decisions so yeah. a little bit of insight into the dynamic may be helpful yeah, yeah. And Nichols' point, the last line is very common, it, that it's very important to be calm and irritated, not get irritated. It is true. We are human. I mean, I, I keep telling in every, every time that uh, I do so many communication classes, but I have to be very honest. Sometimes you in a busy OPD, when you're on to the 80th or 100th patient, which is we call as burnout, and somebody keeps not understanding what you're saying and covering that, it can be very challenging to maintain your cool. And sometimes we do. I mean, I, I, I think we need to be kind to ourselves, but keep trying that. And over time, as, as Rajni also said, and I'm saying, over time, if we keep suppressing and we, we look at it that way, you know, just saying I will not get irritated will not work. If we have to look at it that way, that same thing we need to etch in our mind. The patient is under stress. The patient is very worried. The patient is under pain. I am in a much better position with all this busy OPD and all. Today, my position of my mental state is much better than the patient's. So I need to give that concession to the patients, even if they are having some irritating uh, queries or something. It, it, it does have, get difficult sometimes, but we can try. I think we are almost at the end of time here. Dinesh, you want to say something before we close? I think uh, you addressed most of the issues which have come up. And uh, of course, uh, we have one beyond uh, also. Yeah. yeah so Dinesh, I just want to add one thing. Yeah, yes. uh, one, one of the things that have, we've talked about also in other, uh, other weeks is uh, to try and understand that uh, whether it's anger, whether it's uh, confusion or whatever, there is always an underlying fear in the patient's or caregiver's mind. And what is, what is a really, uh, I think, a, a, a good way to do it is to try and understand what is the fear. Once you know what they're afraid of and you address the fear directly, the resultant, or the resultant um, you know, uh, 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 other emotions that they display uh, typically does come down. So if we can look past the, the emotion there, they're presenting us with and try and understand what they're afraid of. Is my father going to suffer? Is he going to die? You know, if, if, if I, if, am I going to be able to talk to him ever again? What is the fear? And addressing the fear will often uh, bring down the negative uh, emotion that has been you know, thrown at. Thanks, Mriti. Yeah. So I will, I think on behalf of all the faculty, hand over to the organizers for the feedback. Uh, please do give your feedback. Thank you very much. It was so nice interacting with you all. Thank you and uh, thank you uh, Param, thank you Dr. Dinesh, thank you Dr. Rajni. Um, tomorrow's session is a, is a session on end of life care and bereavement, which I'm sure that uh, many of you will have a lot to discuss. So please do take time to look over the webinar and the ebook and, uh, and we will see you back here tomorrow. Please also do fill in the feedback form and uh, thank you very much again for all your interaction and Great questions. Thank you.